every single day there will be an, an, another person killed and placed just onto a statistic. It has gotten from bad to real to worse now. And we don't know what will happen yet in the next two years of the administration of President Duterte. So if the question is, is it better? No. Definitely it has gotten worse. But now, our freedoms and democratic institutions are again under attack. And they're using all sorts of weapons. Hello and welcome to our new podcast channel, Advocate, by ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, or APHR. This is a four-part series, Parliamentarians at Risk. I'm Oliver Slow. In this episode, we're looking at the Philippines and the tactics used by President Rodrigo Duterte to undermine the political opposition and strengthen his hold on power. Under his watch, the government has used trumped-up lawsuits and other forms of harassment to deliberately target opposition lawmakers the media and human rights activists, particularly those who have criticised his notorious war on drugs. This series, part of a wider research project by APHR, aims to draw attention to the scale and consequences of the human rights violations faced by MPs in the region and their impacts on democracy and society as a whole. These reprisals come in the form of, among others, judicial harassment, surveillance and being arbitrarily stripped of their parliamentary status. APHR's new report on this important topic Parliamentarians at Risk, Reprisals Against Opposition MPs in Southeast Asia, is available on our website, ASEANMP.org. This series is part of our new podcast channel, Advocate by ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. Please share, subscribe and leave reviews wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. On the night of 16 August 2017, Kian de los Santos was shot dead by police in his neighbourhood in Calocan, in the sprawling northern outskirts of the Philippines' capital, Manila. The officers responsible for the killing said on the evening in question they were conducting an anti-drugs operation when they were fired upon by de los Santos. However, eyewitness accounts and CCTV footage show what really happened. De los Santos was grabbed outside his home and dragged through several alleyways and eventually into a dead-end corner. There, police handed him a gun and told him to run before shooting him dead. He was 17 years old. In November 2018, three police officers were found guilty of lying about their testimony and murdering De Los Santos. All were sentenced to between 20 and 40 years in prison. The killing of Kian De Los Santos has been one of the most high-profile incidents in President Rodrigo Duterte's notorious war on drugs and drew significant criticism from many of the country's citizens. One of the first public figures to condemn the killing was Senator Risa Hondiveros, an APHR member and representative of the left-leaning Akabayan Citizens Action Party. An outspoken critic of Duterte's drugs war, Senator Hondiveros has consistently promoted a pro-human rights agenda in the Senate, and as a result has been the target of threats and harassment by the Duterte administration. She was one of those who pushed heavily for a Senate investigation into the police officers who killed De Los Santos and amid fears of police retaliation, took witnesses of the murder into her custody. As a result, and despite getting written permission from the witnesses and their parents, Senator Hontiveros is currently facing several charges, including for kidnapping, wiretapping and obstruction of justice. Um, I really, and and my team here in the office, really see um, those cases, there were three up to recently, um, as political harassment, as part of the president's general... Um, social project, political project of his own version of shock and awe against the Filipino public, instilling fear, especially in the communities which have borne the brunt of the extrajudicial killings, but also towards political society to demobilize Filipinos. And that has been his similar attitude to opposition politicians. The attacks against Senator Hontiveros and other opposition MPs in the Philippines a part of a worrying trend across Southeast Asia, of governments resorting to politically motivated charges against the opposition, a tactic known as lawfare. MPs are also facing online harassment, being the victims of disinformation campaigns, as well as other acts of intimidation. What I have is 
in a general election held in May 2016, Rodrigo Duterte was voted in as the new president of the Philippines, previously the mayor of Mindanao, a cluster of islands in the country's south. Duterte had proved a controversial figure in the build-up to the vote. During his campaign, he projected a strongman image, promising to kill thousands of so-called criminals and end crime within a matter of months. His landmark domestic policy was a brutal drugs war that he said would end the country's illegal narcotics trade. President Duterte has delivered on his promise of a war on drugs. Since he took office in June 2016, police have killed more than 8,600 people as part of his anti-drugs campaign, according to the United Nations. Some believe the real figure is higher than 20,000. Numerous rights groups have condemned the drug war, with Human Rights Watch describing it as, quote, crimes against humanity targeting the urban poor. While Amnesty International has said human rights violations are happening in the Philippines, with, quote, near total impunity. As well as international condemnation, Duterte has also faced criticism at home for his war on drugs. Attorney Maria Soltol from the human rights group Carapatan said that her organisation had documented human rights abuses against sectors of the peasants, indigenous peoples, workers, youth and all others. Uh, precisely because the government has been making many oppressive measures targeting dissenters, activists and human rights defenders. So most of our um, human rights workers on the ground, as what I uh, said earlier, have already been in jail or are facing many trumped-up cases. And some of them have been killed already in the line of duty. So I could say that um, it has gotten from bad to really to worse now. And we don't know what will happen yet in the next two years of the administration of President Duterte. Jose Luis Martin C. Gascon chairperson of the Philippines Human Rights Commission, agrees and said there has been an increase in human rights violation under Duterte's rule. Um, a marked increase in attacks uh, and vilification, intimidation, harassment targeted at civil society groups who are speaking up against uh, the violations that they see. Um, and it takes different forms from constraints on the ability to operate, to um, um, uh, regular surveillance, to what is uh, what is referred to in, in currently as red tagging, where people are being um, tagged as uh, either communists or 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 cuddlers or supporters of uh, drug syndicates, even though they are not. You know? uh, they're just speaking up against the killings, and then they and then they're sort of like. Uh, painted with a wide, big brush and said, oh, you're all enemies of the state, you're all planning to destabilize the, the government. In early May 2020, ABS-CBN, a leading television network that's been critical of Duterte, was forced off air after its broadcast license, which is granted by Congress, was not renewed. A month later, two journalists from the independent news website Rapla, its CEO Maria Ressa, and former reporter Reynaldo Santos Jr., were found guilty under a cyber libel law. I appeal to you, the journalists in this room, the Filipinos who are listening, to protect your rights. We are meant to be a cautionary tale. We are meant to make you afraid. Right? So, I appeal again. <clears throat> don't be afraid. Because if you don't use your rights, you will lose them if we don't challenge a brazen move to try to roll back the rights guaranteed in the Constitution. We will lose them. Ressa and Santos face a potential six-year prison sentence. Numerous human rights groups, including APHR, have said the charges are politically motivated and called for them to be immediately dropped. Since his election victory, Duterte has been openly hostile towards the media. In a press conference shortly after the vote, he responded to a question about the killing of reporters by saying, It translates as, just because you're a journalist, you're not exempt from assassination if you're a son of a bitch. Investigative reporter Rowena C. Paran said the president's hostility towards the media 
has had a major impact on the ability of journalists to do their jobs. There is a climate of fear. There's a very clear uh, climate of fear. There's, uh, as I was saying, there was there's self-censorship because you're scared of how people would react to your stories. So, um, and it impacts on the editorial decisions. I mean, even if newsrooms don't own up to it, it's clear that uh, selection of stories, selection of sources are, are affected by this kind of uh, atmosphere. Among those also targeted by Duterte's administration are opposition lawmakers particularly those who have spoken out against his war on drugs and other policies. As APHR found in its report, Parliamentarians at Risk, since taking office, the Duterte administration has used a range of tactics against opposition lawmakers, including trumped-up criminal charges, death threats and aggressive and misogynistic rhetoric, large-scale disinformation campaigns, as well as more subtle manipulation of democratic processes. In terms of attacks against opposition MPs, one of the most high-profile cases is that of Senator Leila de Lima, an APHR member who was the Philippines Justice Secretary under President Duterte's predecessor, Benigno Aquino III. In 2016, shortly after Duterte was elected, Senator de Lima opened a Senate investigation into the extrajudicial killings that were being committed under the guise of the drug war. Months later, she was arrested on drugs-related charges and remains in detention. The United Nations, the European Union and countless human rights groups, including APHR, have called the charges politically motivated and for Senator de Lima's immediate release. Shortly before her arrest, Senator de Lima conducted an interview with Vice News. You know, many of my calls are actually hate calls in this phone. All of these unidentified numbers, these are trawlers, these are haters. I've been getting a lot of hate messages, hate callers, and also death threats ever since the House of Representatives in their probe publicized my uh, phone number and even my home address. I went ahead because it's part of my job and because it's the right thing to do. In its recent report, Parliamentarians at Risk, APHR documented how at least seven other opposition MPs who have been critical of President Duterte and his policies have been targeted in politically motivated cases. Although authorities have relied on a range of different laws, including those for child abuse, kidnapping, wiretapping and rebellion, the cases all fit a familiar pattern. Those targeted are typically lawmakers who have used their public positions to denounce the war on drugs and other controversial policies of the government. Lawmakers targeted include members of the Maccabean bloc, as well as former Senator Antonio Trelanes. In February 2020, Trelanes spoke at the International Forum on Lawfare, which was held in Manila. Good morning, everyone. I was actually... Uh... I was initially tasked to be one of the speakers in uh, the plenary sessions, but uh, because of lawfare, I could not, precisely because I have a hearing uh, in the afternoon. It's one of the 15 cases that I'm facing, um, filed by this administration. Three more were revived uh, from previous administration. So in all, I'm facing 20 criminal cases. It's supposed to be a badge of honor. Then there are the cases against Senator Hontiveros, who is accused of kidnapping, wiretapping and obstruction of justice. All of the charges are related to a role in sheltering witnesses to the murder of Kiandolo Santos. And she told APHR that she agrees with the assessment that the cases against her are politically motivated. In my case and in the case of almost all or all all of the opposition politicians active today, my actions have been uh, above ground, open and legal. Um, and, and as a lawmaker, I'm very careful to to conduct my parliamentary work uh, according to the uh, code of conduct and ethics of of people working in government, and so. The, the cases and the other forms of harassment are really uh, an abuse of power by the president, by, by the administration, and particularly the executive, to try to, um, what he cannot co-opt, to try to intimidate into, into silence and, and uh, immobility. But 
that's not acceptable. Senator Teresa also raised the case of her friend and colleague, Senator Leila de Lima, who has been imprisoned on falsified drugs charges since early 2017. Very concerning. Um, Senator Laila, after that relentless campaign uh, from the president's, well, bully pulpit in Malacanang Palace to his social media uh, army of trolls and fake news, organized and funded and content generated by the administration uh, against her, he has been able to keep her in illegal detention for uh, three years now this month with no solid charges against her, no uh, evidence that is acceptable in court because merely collected from convicted uh, drug convicts. However, attacks on opposition MPs are not the only approach Duterte is using to strengthen his hold on power. Aggressive rhetoric is one. His administration has resorted to open threats and unsubstantiated claims to intimidate and delegitimize opponents. Duterte has threatened to jail lawmakers who vote against him while his government has also released public lists of those, including lawmakers, supposedly plotting to bring down the government or engaging in the drugs trade. Much of his rhetoric has been deeply misogynistic. Boracay Island is just the beginning, and the girls there, the foreigners, are waiting for you, gentlemen, to visit the place. They are all on the beach uh, sunbathing. You are uh, invited. To, I have not been there. You know what? There was this three-day no water. I was in Davao. So everybody was complaining. And uh, I was even afraid to come here because what if my girlfriend will not be able to, to take a bath? Uh, she will smell like hell. So... I said, uh, Opposition I MPs in the Philippines have also been red-tagged, where they're accused of being communists or communist sympathizers and portrayed as threats to national security. Red-tagging in the Philippines is not a mere threat, however. Some activists and lawyers who have been labelled as such have been physically attacked and killed. This aggression can be a witness in the online sphere too, with government opponents often the targets of abuse or disinformation by a litany of pro-Duterte websites and social media accounts. During the 2016 electoral campaign, Duterte's online supporters, dubbed Duterteros, gained infamy by zealously promoting their candidate while aggressively harassing and threatening opponents, often with violence. In September 2020, Facebook shut down more than 100 fake accounts linked to the police and the military in the Philippines for engaging in, quote, coordinated inauthentic behaviour. The social media company said that most of the content in the fake accounts was related to criticism of the opposition, activists and alleged communists. Then there have been the more subtle tactics to manipulate or abuse democratic processes in Congress in order to undermine the opposition. In 2016, APHR's executive director and former Philippine MP Teddy Bagulat Jr. ran in the vote for the Speaker of the House of Representatives, losing out to Pantaleon Alvarez, a member of PDP Laban, of which President Duterte is chairperson. Since the country's return to democracy in 1986, following years of martial law under dictator Ferdinand Marcos, the runner-up in the speaker vote has been made the leader of the minority, a crucial check and balance in parliament. However, shortly after the vote for speaker, the majority leader announced a reinterpretation of house rules, calling for a second vote to elect the minority leader. The vote was won by Danilo Suarez, a Duterte ally. Critics of the move have called it a deliberate manipulation of house rules to ensure a minority representative that is in fact supportive of the government. There have been other subtle moves by the Duterte regime to undermine democracy, including by manipulating the budget. His government has sharply reduced budget allocations to punish lawmakers that oppose its agenda. In December 2017, Pantaleon Alvarez, the Speaker, announced that the infrastructure allocations for 24 lawmakers, all of whom had opposed the reintroduction of the death penalty, and other major state policies would be removed from the 2018 budget. Teddy Begulat Jr. was one of those targeted, as punishment for voting against the reimposition of the death penalty and the invocation of martial law in Mindanao. Nothing for maintenance of roads and highways in my constituent. So even uh, because the Philippines is prone to a lot of disasters, so even disaster mitigating measures, there was no allocation. It was a punishment supposedly for us uh, in, in the opposition, particularly the, those who voted uh, against uh, the reimposition of uh, the death penalty. But 
but uh, in effect, it actually punished our constituents, our people, our taxpayers. At the time, Begalat was representative for Ifugao, a remote and undeveloped part of the northern Philippines. The budget actually is, for many politicians, it's your lifeblood. Nobody, unfortunately, nobody really questions your legislative record or how you voted for or against uh, this bill. No, it's, it's really about uh, the, the money that you bring home for the roads, for their uh, uh, government centers, no, for the scholarship, for the hospitals and clinics. Bagalat said that he believed it was largely because of the slashing of his constituency budget that he lost the 2019 vote to become the Ifugao governor. It affected my political uh, popularity, my uh, leverage among my constituencies. And it affected me in the next elections, in the, the following elections. So I, I lost, I think, uh, largely because of that. So yeah, I think um, many of us were affected by, by this. It was a chilling effect. Bagalat was a member of the majority government under Duterte's predecessor, Benigno Aquino III, and said that there are major differences to being an MP under Duterte including respect for the opposition. One thing I can say was that we respected the right of the opposition to be heard, to express dissent. Our debates would last for weeks. We allowed that because uh, as liberals, I, we, we felt that uh, this was a very important parliamentary uh, principle. You know, the, the power of debate in the parliament is something that we really respected. In the... The third administration, there's no room for dissent. Uh, you allow maybe uh, an hour of debate and then you immediately um, move to have Congress approve the, um, the administration bill, you know, whether it's a terror act or the reimposition of the death penalty or the passage of a budget. You know? So that's, I think that's a very clear distinction you know, between the previous uh, administration. Uh, the way we... Um, respected the opposition, uh, the freedom of the opposition to express dissent, as well as allowing uh, parliamentary debate. In its region-wide research, APHR found that widespread reprisals against parliamentarians have repercussions on society as a whole. Targeting public figures such as MPs with judicial harassment and threats, for example, sends a clear message that anybody in society could face similar treatment. It is a deliberate strategy that aims to have the knock-on effect of silencing all forms of dissent. According to Teddy Bagulat and other opposition MPs, such a scenario is occurring in the Philippines. Those who are already in the parliament are considered uh, the high and mighty, and if you can really silence them, then it's, uh, it's, it's, it has a chilling effect also to the general population. And, and you know, this is not just one instance. You know, it started with the with the incarceration of uh, Senator Laila de Lima. I remember we had that hearing in, in the parliament about uh, the alleged uh, drug connection of Senator Laila. And one of my colleagues asked me, aren't you afraid with this development? And I said, of course, you know, we're all afraid because if they can do it to the senator, <laughs> they can easily do it to us. Of course, that also translates to the general public. That's why it's so difficult for for. Ordinary folks, no, non-politicians, people who were not in power to express dissent or express critical thinking because of what they see, what was happening in, in Parliament, with what happened to us, with what happened to Senator Laila or Senator Trillanes. Despite the huge challenges being faced by opposition MPs, civil society and human rights defenders in the Philippines, those working for democracy and human rights inside the country have called for continued support from the international community. Bagulat said, uh, "What we have right now in the Philippines is we're a rubber stamp, and and for me, I think parliamentarians all over the world should should unite and make sure that that privilege of being able to do oversight on the executive, to be able to provide checks and balance, to have a healthy debate within the parliament, is is respected." Jose Luis Martin C. Gascon from the Philippines Human Rights Commission also urge international actors to maintain their pressure on the Duterte administration to improve their human rights record. To know that there is international solidarity, to know that there is attention to what's happening in this country, even when many are now looking away, is important to us. So uh, constantly be as it was with our struggle against the dictator, 
it didn't happen overnight, no? but because there was just this constant, steadfast um, pounding, um, even when many look away, uh, that ultimately made the difference because we were relentless here and the international partners were relentless outside in ensuring that accountability should be uh, obtained. So that's what we'll all have to do, try and make sure that the bastards don't get away. This episode of APHR's Parliamentarians at Risk podcast series was written and produced by me, Oliver Slow, with editorial input from Elise T.A. Dagusset and Long Tzu Quinn. APHR's work is supported by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, or CEDA, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Open Societies Foundation. For more information about APHR's work, please visit our website, ASEANMP.org. This series is from our new podcast channel, Advocate by ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. Please share, subscribe and leave reviews wherever you get your podcast. The final episode in this series will be available on October the 21st. Thanks for listening.